So I'm wearing my press play shirt uh, post kids camp, and we really did have an awesome week. I want to echo what everybody else is saying, and it really was good timing, this being my second to last week as your pastor, being able to just see how our kids ministry has grown and thrived in these last six and a half years, and uh, that, that means so much to me. And, and if I could just say, uh, if, if anything, continue to pour into the next generation here in Penticton. Uh, I would trade all those boxes full of cash that you guys are going to give me uh, in order for that, that to continue. Uh, but let's get into God's Word. Uh, we are in a series called Final Thoughts, which is really me over the last three weeks of my time with you, trying to share my best pastoral advice and encouragement to you as you move forward into this next season of what God has in store for Beth- Bethel Church and for you as individuals. Um, so last week, I talked about my hope for you. And my hope for you is that you would put your hope in Jesus, in a world that presses and pulls us and tries to get off track. Uh, We slip our hope off of Jesus and onto different things. But anything that isn't based on the hope of Jesus who rose from the dead is a dead hope. So put your hope in Jesus. Today, I want to talk about my challenge for you, my challenge for you. We're reading Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27 together. It'll be on the screen. Uh, or you can open up your device or Bible and join me. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew, against, blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is my challenge to you. Build the house. Build the house. These words in Matthew's gospel are the concluding words of Jesus' great kingdom discourse, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Jesus gives some of his most important teachings, all collected in one place, and then he finishes with this image of a man building a house, or two different men building houses with different foundations. But what Jesus is doing is concluding what's really his vision for reality, what his vision for life is, apprentices of his, their lives will look a certain way as they enter into his kingdom and follow in his footsteps. And so he concludes by saying, listen, if you actually hear what I said and put it into practice, there's going to be a solidity to your life. That trials will come, difficulties, he calls them storms, will come, but you will not fall, you will not crash, you will make it through to the other side. But if you hear what I say and you ignore it, there'll be a crash. You know, if you hear my sermon, you say, oh, that's nice, Jesus, excellently excellently delivered, I was very entertained, but you know what, it doesn't really fit in my life, or it seems like a lot of effort, or it's not really relevant to me in these days, I'm just going to leave it alone and go on. Jesus says, that's actually a foolish way to live, and it's going to lead to a crash. It's actually a sobering warning that Jesus gives. At the end of his most important sermon, he doesn't give a, a cute story or a poem, He gives a dire warning to those who are listening. In fact, he doesn't just give one warning. He gives a series of warnings in his conclusion, four in a row that make the same point with different images. He says there's two gates. There's one gate that's narrow and leads to a narrow path, and one gate that's wide and leads to a wide path. They look very similar. The wide path might be easier, but at the end of it, there's a cliff. He said there's two trees, a good tree and a bad tree. The good tree produces good fruit. The bad tree produces bad fruit, and it will be cut down and destroyed. There are two kinds of disciples, true disciples and false disciples. Not everyone who cries out, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who performs any miracles. Not everyone who does Christian ministry is actually one of my followers. They're not actually, they don't actually know me. And in his final warning, he says there are two houses. One's built on a solid rock foundation. The other is built on sand. One house will stand in the storm. The other will collapse on its inhabitants. End of sermon. Go have a nice Sunday lunch. (laughs) 
In fact, what he's doing here, these contrasts are a continuation of what I think is the major, if not, if not just one of the major themes of his whole sermon, because his whole sermon is a series of contrasts. If you read earlier, he says there's two kinds of righteousness. There's the righteousness of the Pharisees, and there's the righteousness of God's kingdom. There's two kinds of salt. One adds flavor and preserves, and the other one is useless. There's two kinds of light. One shines, and the other is hidden. There's two different people who give to the needy. One gives to the needy publicly in order to receive praise and adoration from people. The other one does it secretly in order to bless God. There's two kinds of people who fast and pray. Some do it in public so people can think they're great. Others do it privately just to do it secretly in God's presence. What's he doing? Why is he making these contrasts? It's, it's tempting to assume that Jesus is just talking about a good way to live and a bad way to live. There's good people and there's bad people. Be a good person. Or there's a good path and a bad path. Choose the good path. Or there's good actions and bad actions. Do the good actions. But he's not actually doing that. He's doing something much, much deeper. He's talking about hidden realities, not visible realities. He's talking about the issues of the heart, not necessarily just the religious outward appearance of what people see in your life. On the surface, both paths look the same. Both trees look the same. Both houses look the same. Both prayers look the same. Both gifts to the needy look the same. But one path kills its travelers. One tree poisons those who eat its fruit. One house collapses on its residents. One act of charity is an act of personal promotion, not an act of love. So on the outside, I mean, the Pharisees, they looked as righteous as you could get. They did everything right. They followed all the rules. They did everything the way they were supposed to do it. But Jesus actually criticizes them the most. Why? Because on the inside, they were corrupt. He actually, at one point, called them whitewashed tombs. He says, you're like a grave that's clean and pristine on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of corruption and death. So Jesus isn't saying there's one group who are doing the right things and another group who are doing the wrong things, and you should do the right things instead of the wrong things. Because the Pharisees were doing all the right things. He's saying there's two groups of people whose behavior looks exactly the same on the outside. The hidden reality, though, is that something vastly different is going on in the inside. You know, we see this playing out in real life in our own actions because motivations count, right? This is what Jesus is talking about. He's not just talking about actions. He's talking about motivations of the heart. And if you grew up with siblings, you know how to annoy your siblings while technically following the rules. As the youngest child... I was an expert at annoying people. I'm still pretty good at it, you know? And so you learn, you know, mom and dad, they, they say, don't touch your sister. And so you technically don't touch her, but you get really close to her and you, you know, go all around her face and I'm not touching you, you can't get mad. So technically you're not breaking the rules, but in your heart you're still trying to annoy your sister, which is what your parents are trying to get you to stop doing. And this is what Jesus is talking about. This is the critique he's bringing in his sermon. He's critiquing behavior-based righteousness. He's critiquing those who only focus on outward appearance and technicalities while ignoring deeper issues of the heart, while ignoring issues of justice and love for neighbor. Think about, this is, this is an example I've used in the past, but it bears repeating. Think about the last time that you lied. And I know for some of you that's like 40 years ago, you know? Just try to remember the last, you know, lying's a sin. We've all done it once or twice. Think about the last time that you lied. Now, why did you do it? Do you remember why you lied? There was a, a cute video online that was circulating, and um, this dad, you know, he had his cell phone camera, and in front of him was like a, a plastic container of cupcakes, and the cupcakes had clearly been pillaged, and the, uh, the icing on them was licked off or eaten off of many of the cupcakes. And he's doing this first-person view of the cupcakes, and then he pans over, and there's this little boy who looks to be about four years old, and he's just covered in icing. He's got icing all over his face and on his hands and his clothes. And the dad says, did you eat these cupcakes? No. Was this you? No. Did you do this? No. And he just denies it over and over and over again, even though all the evidence is smeared all over his body. And why did that little boy lie? Because he was afraid. He was afraid of getting in trouble. He was afraid of the consequences he was going to face 
if he told the truth. That's one of the reasons why we lie. We lie out of fear. We lie because if we tell the truth, we don't want to get in trouble for the truth. You know, uh, the officer comes to your car. Do you know how fast you were going? Oh, I'm sure I was going the speed limit. Uh, The gun must be wrong. But we know we're lying to try to get out of consequences. There's another reason we lie, though. And the reason is pride, which is maybe a more grown-up reason to lie because I tell my kids all the time, I don't need anyone's permission to eat cupcakes. I can eat as many cupcakes as I want. I can eat them before dinner. I can eat them for breakfast because I am a dad. I have earned the right to eat cupcakes whenever I want. Just don't tell your mom. I can eat them whenever I want to eat them. And so for me, I don't, if I eat cupcakes, I don't have to lie fearing that I'm going to get in trouble. For me, if I lied about eating cupcakes, it'd be out of pride because I don't want people to think that I lack self-control. I don't want to be one of those people who can't handle their cupcakes. You know what I mean? You don't want to be a glutton who can't deal with the temptation. So I'm going to lie out of personal pride. So our motivation for the sin of lying is fear or pride. Now flip the script. Why do we tell the truth? There's lots of really good reasons to tell the truth. We tell the truth because we know it's the right thing to do. We tell the truth because we love people, so we want to tell them the truth, even if it's hard for them to hear. We tell the truth because, as Jesus says, the truth will set you free. But there are also negative reasons to tell the truth, right? So if lying is a sin and the wages of sin is death, I want to avoid lying at all costs because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want God to get me. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to tell the truth. So why am I telling the truth? Out of fear. Or I want to tell the truth because I don't want people to think I'm a liar. You know, I'm a respected pastor in this community, and if people think that I'm a liar, it'll ruin my reputation. So I'm going to tell the truth out of pride. So if I lie because of fear and pride, and I tell the truth because of fear and pride, in God's eyes, what's the difference between lying and telling the truth? There's no difference. This is exactly what Jesus is getting at. You can do all the righteous acts in the world, but if your righteousness is motivated by sinful motivations, it's just as bad as just ignoring righteousness altogether. So outwardly religious people might be reading their Bible, praying every day, but they might be doing it because there's something, they worry something bad will happen if they don't. Or you might be showing up to church on Sunday. Every single week you have perfect attendance, but you only do it because you're worried that God will stop blessing your life if you spend your Sundays at the beach like those pagans. So we have all these outward motivations. There's people in this room who have a variety of motivations. You all look the same. You're all in church. But what's in the heart? That's what Jesus really cares about. Fear and pride as a motivation for righteousness makes our righteous actions as bad as our sinful ones. So Jesus says there's two paths, they both look the same. Two trees that both look the same. Two houses that both look the same on the outside. Two truth tellers that both tell the truth. One's motivated by love, the other by fear and pride. Two Bible readers that can both quote scripture, but one's motivated by love for God's word, the other one's motivated by fear of God's wrath. And the funny thing is the opposite is true as well because Jesus gives us examples where people actually broke the rules, but they did it with righteous motivations, and he commends them. So what's going on here? Jesus is telling us that there are people in the world that think they're following Jesus. They think they're in the kingdom of God, but they're actually on a path that leads to a cliff. So going back to our specific text today, that's basically the Sermon on the Mount in general, but specifically Jesus gives us this contrast between two houses, two houses that look the same on the outside, but one will collapse in its residences. You know, one of them is built on a rock, one of them is built on sand, and Galilee being a dry place was also prone to flash floods. So you could think, oh, it doesn't rain here very much, I don't need a strong foundation, but once in a while, boom, the winds would come, the rain would come, the floods would rise, and the house would be knocked down. And of course, Jesus isn't just talking about carpentry. The the idea of a house in the first century came to be a metaphor for a person's life. So like your, your life is like a house. It has different compartments, like different rooms where different things happen. You need to construct it well. You need, you need to maintain it over time in order for it to, to be healthy. And if you've done a good job building it, it will survive the weather or survive bad circumstances. And Jesus is super honest with us. Jesus doesn't mince words. He says, listen, the storm will come. 
Life isn't always sunny and sweet. If your life has always been sunny and sweet, you haven't lived long enough yet. There is always a storm that will come. The difference is not whether or not you'll face the storm. The difference is whether you'll still be standing once the storm passes. And Jesus says, if you want to still be standing, you need to build your house, build your house on the solid rock. He calls the wise builder, uh, he calls the one who built his house on the rock wise, and the builder who constructed his house on the sand foolish. The word foolish is the Greek word moros, which is the, where we get the word moron from. Right? Jesus is using strong language. It means stupid, unintelligent, unthoughtful. I'm sorry, I know there's children in the room. But basically, the person who builds his house on the sand is someone who doesn't think about their life. Someone who just lets life happen. They're, they're cruising on autopilot. Things kind of happen and they just react to them. They're not intentional about how they live. They're just reacting to the world around them. So their perspectives on social issues and ethics and politics shift with the shifting sands of popular culture. Their habits form not from intentional discipline, but from the pressures and temptations of their environment. They follow their cravings instead of pursuing virtue. They seek personal satisfaction instead of seeking to serve and love others. And they wind up knowingly or unknowingly out of ignorance, uh, contributing to injustices in the world instead of working to seek justice for the oppressed and liberation for those who are in bondage. They're morose, unthoughtful about their lives. And when the storm comes, things will collapse. And, and this type of person tends to blame shift and say, what did I do to deserve this? Well, you might not have done anything to deserve this. You just weren't thinking. You just weren't prepared. You weren't thoughtful about your life. You didn't build the right foundation. And this is the result. Jesus wants us to be ready. He wants us to think. He wants us to live wisely. So, I've kind of been talking around this issue of building the house, but I want to get very practical as I finish today. I don't want you to just build a house, as my sermon title says. I want you to build your house wisely, to build your life wisely on the foundation of Jesus. So what does that look like in practice? I think Jesus' sermon gives us at least three ideas of what that would look like. <clears throat> Number one, listen to the teachings of Jesus. Verse 24 says, everyone who hears these words of mine, it begins with actually listening. It begins with actually considering what Jesus has to say, taking him seriously. You know, there's a lot of information out there today. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of gurus and teachers and so-called experts. In fact, the amount of information that you receive on a daily basis is far more than you actually have the capability to respond to actually do anything about. Someone has done, done work on, on, on a curve of information growth, and the rate of information growing in the world, the total amount of information that's available doubles every year. And we're on a rate where it's going to double every 12 hours eventually. So twice a day, the amount of available information is going to double. To put that in perspective, in the year 1900, that rate of growth was once every 100 years. And it wasn't long before that where it was once every 1,000 years. So we we're on this accelerating curve in this aptly named information age. But there's way more information available than we have the ability to handle or put into practice. So we're going to have to make some decisions about who we're going to listen to and what information we're going to prioritize. And so you're in church today, so you obviously expect me to tell you to prioritize Jesus. And yes, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we prioritize the one whose words have shaped the world more than anyone else in the last 2,000 years? Why wouldn't we prioritize the one who performed the greatest act of sacrificial love the world has ever seen? Why wouldn't we prioritize the words of the one who literally predicted his death and resurrection and then pulled it off? That guy is worth listening to, not just as one voice in a cacophony of sound, but as the preeminent voice in all history. We should consider what Jesus has to say. And it begins with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. If you spent your whole life studying those three chapters, it would be a life well lived. So we start by listening to Jesus. Secondly, we practice the teachings of Jesus. He says, verse 24 continues, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice 
is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I could read the blueprints of a house, read the building plans, and, and let's say I could understand every aspect of it, every, every joint, every joist, every, every, every beam, every timber, everything about it, I could understand it. And I could even talk about it. I could even tell other people, about it. Look, about, look at this, I'm going to explain it to you. I could teach in a trade school other carpenters what it means to build a house. But if I don't actually start swinging a hammer, I will produce nothing of value. So Jesus is not here just to, to, to fill us, fill our overstuffed brains with more information. He wants to transform us. And transformation comes when we actually put into practice what Jesus has said. The Sermon on the Mount is a building plan. After you read it, you need to start building. Mind and body are required if we want to see the life change that Jesus, is, Jesus promises, this life of blessing that he lays out for us. I love this language Jesus uses of practice. Athletes know that if they want to perform well on the field, they have to spend hours and hours and years practicing and strengthening and developing their skills. A baseball pitcher doesn't throw a 100-mile-an-hour fastball naturally, right? That pitcher has to spend all kinds of time in practice where no one else is watching to be able to do that when everybody's watching. See, the Pharisees were all about the field. They were all about the crowd. They were all about performing in public. And Jesus says, actually, it's all about what you do in private. It's all about the practice. That's where life changes. That's where transformation happens. The practice, the things you do in secret that only the Father sees. James, Jesus' brother, was reflecting on the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, when he wrote this. James chapter 1, 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Imagine looking in a mirror first thing in the morning and seeing the bedhead and seeing the eye gunk and seeing, you know, all that is your glorious self as you get out of bed and then just walking away and going out in public. You know, we don't do that. We allow the scripture, we need to allow the scriptures to point out the sin, to point out the, the brokenness and the corruption and then do something about it in the power of God's spirit with the help of Christ to transform our lives and make us new. Over the past year, we've talked a lot about follow, uh, practicing the way of Jesus. Jesus gives us this rhythm of life to pursue, not out of a religious duty based on fear and pride, but from a pure heart that seeks to be near the Lord because we've tasted and seen that the Lord is so, so good. So we practice the teachings of Jesus. But finally, we practice the teachings of Jesus in community, with others, not alone. Jesus assumes that the Sermon on the Mount will take a lifetime of practice, but he also assumes that we will need each other in order to build our house. We in the modern West have a very individualistic mindset. Everything's about our personal rights and freedoms, about individualism, and it's not necessarily, necessarily bad. In fact, those concepts come from a biblical view that every human being is made in the image of God, and so they have rights and privileges. But often we've let that pendulum swing at the expense of the value of community. Whereas in first century Israel, you know, family, community, nation, those things were more important than the individual, and we needed to make sure that we were doing things together for the sake of one another. And our English language doesn't help us because the word you can mean you singular or you plural. And so when we read the Bible, we often take the word you and apply it just to me, the individual. But when Jesus says things like you are the light of the world, he's not saying you, Dave, or you, Chris, or you, Jim, are the light of the world. He's saying you, Bethel Church, are the light of the world. When you follow me, you shine. You together corporately are the salt of the earth. You preserve and protect and bring flavor to reality as you trust in Jesus. And so as we take the Sermon on the Mount, we have to recognize that we build together. You know, I'm not an incredibly handy person when it comes to, you know, renovations and carpentry. I know just enough to do something really dangerous. 
But what I do know is that construction projects always go better when you have help, when you build with a team. Jesus knows that we need the help and expertise of wise and godly friends to help us build, to help us build on the right foundation. So don't build alone. Don't, don't do life alone. Don't read your Bible only alone. Read with someone. Don't pray only alone. Pray with someone. Don't struggle alone. Bring your pain and your weaknesses to someone else so they can share their strength with you. Jesus gave us this community for a reason because he knew we would need each other. It's said in the, the first story in the entire Bible, it is not good for man to be alone. We need to be together. Now, I said there were three things we need to build the house, but there's a bonus fourth thing. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the power and the presence of God with us to build on the foundation of Jesus. We need his guidance, his counseling, his friendship, his empowerment, and his teaching in order to build our lives on the solid rock of Jesus. It's not a coincidence that right before these four final warnings in his conclusion of his sermon, he implores us, ask, seek, knock, the door will be opened. Ask the Father for the Holy Spirit. He's a good Father. He wants to pour out the Holy Spirit on you to give you everything you need for life and godliness in order to have that relationship with you, that connection to heaven. The Holy Spirit wants to be near and work alongside you as you build. As you study Jesus' teachings, you must be empowered by the Spirit. Your practice of his teachings must be empowered by the Spirit. And your community of support and accountability must be full of the Holy Spirit. And God, we with you as you build the house. So as you listen and practice in a Spirit-empowered community, over time and through life storms, you'll build a house on a firm foundation. I'll say it again. As you listen and practice in a spirit-empowered community, over time and through life storms, you'll build a house on a firm foundation. That's my challenge for you. Build the house. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you love us deeply, that you saw us in our state, in our dismay. You saw us in this rickety house that was about to collapse because we had built it on sand and you sent your son Jesus into the world to come and not just be our savior but to also teach us and to show us a better way. So Jesus, I pray that as we listen to your words that you would give us ears to hear what you're saying and you would also strengthen our hands for the task of building, of putting into practice what you have taught us. Lord, thank you that you've given us a community to do that together, to, to share the strength of one another and to, to build together with different, different expertise and experiences that we can all bring, come together to, to build wisely. And God, thank you that you've also given us the Holy Spirit, your presence and your power to teach us, to guide us, to counsel us, to lead us along the way and to give us everything we would ever need to build the life you've called us to live. So we thank you, God. Help us, Lord. Our desire is to build on the solid rock of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.